thanks for the intro, Scott, and it's great to be here. I think uh, Jess and the crew that put this summit together really have to be congratulated. It's wonderful that uh, surfing is coming together and uh, discussing potentially uh, a new future. So we'll wait till my, uh, my first slide uh, comes up. But this morning I drove down from Santa Barbara. I live in, in, in Santa Barbara. We left at four in the morning and we got here at six. Two hour run, it was a very, very quick run. And the first place uh, we went to, because everything in Laguna Beach was closed, was Thalia Street, a break that I'd uh, surfed many years ago. And we wanted to uh, check out the surf. I was with uh, Professor Stuart Sweeney, he's a professor of geography at uh, UCSB. And uh, we went down to check out the surf at Thalia. It was about one to two, but there were six little grommets out of the water, stoked out of their mind. And joining them were just a whole crew of other young people, guys and girls. And to me, that represented the essence of surfing, that concept of being stoked. And those young kids represented our future. And it was great to be around that positive energy because some of you people know me, and that is what I have devoted my entire life to, is to being stoked, staying stoked, and getting other people stoked. So there's been a lot of talk about getting people stoked today and getting more surfers in the water in. Is that good or is that bad? Is it good that we have more surfers in the water? Is it good that we have more surfers in surf parks? That's a question that, that all of you guys have to answer. But I'm going to give you my answer. I love getting people stoked and seeing people stoked. Because when you get stoked, you look at life differently. When you get stoked, life is a lot better. No matter what problems and issues you're going through, when you get stoked and get other people stoked, it's like this weight has been lifted off your shoulders. So I wanted to talk to you today about the world's first ocean surf park. So it's a little bit different to what's being discussed today in terms of surf parks outside of the ocean. I wanted to talk to you about the world's first ocean surf park and I'm hoping that if there's enthusiasm in the room that we can make this happen here in Southern California. A quick disclaimer, I'm on the board of directors of Surfrider Foundation. I was the first professional surfer to become a member of Surfrider Foundation in 1984. And the views I express today might not be the same views that are expressed by Chad Nelson environmental director of Surf Rider Foundation and the foundation that I love and that I've worked for for so many years. Waves have value. It's a simple list of surfonomics and some of the waves around the world and the value associated with those particular waves. I dug around a bit on the, on the internet over the last few days. Significant value. Rincon, Puerto Rico, 52 million. Gold Coast Australia, 2 billion. Sebastian Inlet, 93 million. You might have heard of that break and a guy who grew up surfing that way, a guy called Kelly Slater. Artificial reefs. Not too much talk about artificial reefs today, but artificial reefs may work one day. There's this interesting statement from the CEO of Surfrider Foundation, Jim Moriarty. Artificial reefs have been around for over 16 years and have yet to deliver on the promise. I want to talk to you today about a system and a wave that has delivered on a promise. I think in our quest to create surf breaks, every single one of us in this room has been overlooking the obvious and it's been hiding in plain sight. This type of handmade wave, not an artificial wave, and I think Every single person in this room needs to ban that word from their vocabulary. Because when you create a wave, whether it's in the ocean, or whether you create it in a wave park, man, it's not artificial, it's handmade. This is where I grew up, Durban, South Africa. You can see a series of four jetties. I lived across the street from this wave, one of those four jetties, a place called the Bay of Plenty. Plenty of waves. You can see this photo here, taken on a pretty good day at the Bay of Plenty. This is a small day, four to five feet, 
But the Bay of Plenty at the time, in the 70s, was the longest tube ride in the world. And I'm not bullshitting you, but tubes 15 to 20 seconds. This is the bay at size. Picture of the Bay of Plenty, 1988, uh, 1977. But you can see the perfect setup at the Bay of Plenty. And on the far right hand side of that picture, you can see a little outcropping of rocks. And that was a jetty, a groin, that went out for 150 yards. Just down the road from the Bay of Plenty is another groin wave, jetty wave, a place called the New Pier. This was taken last year. There's a couple of other good groin waves, man-made waves around the world. You heard of this wave, Kira in Australia. Guy in the audience here, Peter Towning, became world champion riding this wave. A guy called Michael Peterson riding Kira. And just up the way from Kira is another wave that most probably breaks about 360 days out of 365, a place called Durambar. Also created by the jetty. A little bit closer to home, Sebastian Inlet, which generates $93 million a year. Home to a young guy who you might have heard of. This is a photo taken in the early 90s, or maybe the late 80s. Kelly Slater grew up surfing Sebastian Inlet. Not a bad way. Another way created by man, created by a jetty. Article from the paper a few days ago, Sebastian Inlet annually generates $93 million. Right down the road from where I live in Santa Barbara is another man-made way, a place called the Sandspit, a legendary way, also created by the gym. And a lot closer to home, it's a picture of Danny Kwok in the 80s, Echo Beach, 56th Street, in Newport Beach. Great wave on its day, also created by a simple system of groins. Myth. Man-made structures like groins destroy beaches. This is a myth. Reynard E. Fleck. In Southern California, it is precisely the act of humans that have made many previously narrow beaches wide or created new ones altogether. It's a description, I'm not going to read it all, of man-made structures as defined by um, the Army Corps of Engineers. The bottom one is the one that I'm interested in, groin. A shore protection structure built, usually perpendicular to the shoreline, to trap literal drift or retard erosion of the shore. They have been built for one reason only to prevent beach erosion. I'm saying maybe they should be built for two reasons. To trap sand and to create great waves. And around those groins, let's build clubs. Let's build surf, surf clubs. Let's meld what they've done in Australia and South Africa with the surf life-saving clubs with surfing. Create a groin, put up a surf club, and that club will be accessible to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people every year. Can you imagine the stoke that can be generated by young people and families getting together on the beach and riding these waves that are created by man? This is an interesting statistic. More men's world titles have been won by people that have grown up surfing growing waves. Man-made waves. 19 out of 37. Okay, Kelly State has got quite a few of those. <laughs> but there's a list. Interesting. From my beach, Martin Potter. And also, some of, when I think of some of the surfers that have grown up on my beach, my old beach, Bay of Plenty, Michael Thompson, you might have heard of them. He's employed a few thousand people in this country when he started Gotcha. Paul Nordee was one of our mates from the Bay of Plenty. We all served together. So this wave that I used to ride, that had a restaurant right in front of it and a club, created this amazing generation of surfers in South Africa. And they have the same thing that happens with these great jetty breaks in Australia. Some of the benefits associated with this concept of 
salt water surf parks. They generate millions of revenue. It's been proved. Surf, surf economics has proven that. It promotes an inexpensive and sustainable outdoor activity. There's no, there's no carbon footprint here. Once that jetty or groin is erected, that's it. There's no more maintenance. Sure, every 20 years or so there might need to be some maintenance, but it doesn't need electricity to create a wave. And I'm not in any way, shape or form criticizing this concept of surf parks, of creating these parks away from the ocean. I think it's an amazing idea and one day it might get surfing to the Olympics. But I'm saying we do have an alternative here that is relatively simple. And it's relatively, as I'll show you a little bit later, inexpensive. It connects people to, to nature. It may or may not relieve overcrowding. You start setting up these surf parks and surf breaks, just by the nature of them creating a great wave, it might bring more and more people to that area. So it may or may not generate overcrowding. What it will do, it'll get more surfers surfing and get more people stoked. Teaches people to surf. Connects families through a common sport, which I think is one of the wonderful things that's been happening to surfing over the last 20 years, is that surfing demographics have changed. It's not just 12 to 19 and then your surfing life stops. I'm 58 years old now. I'm as stoked as I ever was. I'm teaching my four-year-old son to surf. Surfing has become a family sport and creating these breaks with a corresponding surf park with them, where families can go and spend a great day down at the beach, I think is a wonderful uh, uh, recreation. Also, the surf park will protect the shoreline. Instead of putting up a groin to protect the shoreline and have surfing as the secondary, what about having surfing as the primary and the secondary function of the jetty or groin is to actually protect the shoreline? It's a, uh, it's a training ground and it's just that great meeting place. The groin is a proven design. I know, I grew up on it. I've seen some of the best waves in my life that I have ridden, and I've ridden a lot of good waves in my life. Some of the best tubes I've had in my life have come from groin breaks. A few years ago, I was back east. They got a great break in the Hamptons called Georgica Jetty. Have you ever heard of that break? On a hurricane, there's a jetty break there that's as good as anything in the United States. I served a break right under the shadow of the LA airport a few years back, a place called DNW. Just a little jetty break. There's a little jetty that sticks out there. Insane six-foot tubes. I know Jenny's work. It's work and it's been the proving ground and the learning ground for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of observers around the world. There's a number of different drawing designs. This is taken from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, report. Straight, incline, zigzag. It's never really been studied. Like, what is the best configuration of a groin for surfing? We don't know. These are some of the growing designs that are available. The one in the bottom right hand corner seems to be the one that works the best for surfing. It's got a core of, of stone and on the outside it has big 20 ton boulders. You might be thinking like, what is all this going to cost? Like, it sounds like it's a $10 million project. That's what a 150 yard growing costs. One million dollars. That's taken straight from a financial report of a groin that was going to be built in uh, um, Carolina, North Carolina. So there are the construction costs, there's all the details associated with that groin. 450 foot long, 20 feet wide at the top, armored rocks, cost a million bucks. Sure, there are other, there are other costs associated with this, um, with a groin. You've got your initial cost, a million, Initial beach nourishment, which may or may not be needed depending on the particular beach that you choose, 1.2 million. You've got permitting and design, 1.25 million. Your total cost, three and a half million bucks to create a jetty that can be there for 30 years. How would this be funded? How could you fund, where could the three and a half million bucks come from? Cities? and municipalities, their park and recreation department. If Sebastian Inlet can generate $93 million, 
you think maybe LA County might be interested in creating a surf park that can generate something similar when Los Angeles County has way more consistent surf than the East Coast? Maybe not. Maybe Quicksilver is interested in Quicksilver Reef, or maybe Doug Palladini from Vans is interested in Vans Point. There's a potential to get the industry involved. Surf school concessions. Each jetty creates most probably four breaks. One, two breaks on either side of that uh, jetty. Admission fees, maybe there's a parking structure and people actually pay admission fee. Then there's the surf park membership. You know, what's it gonna cost to be a member of this little building that's on the beach that can be used both for recreation and also for education? Here's some comparative costs of other recreational structures. I thought maybe I'd do a comparison skate park, basketball court. Kind of interesting to see basketball gyms, seven million bucks. How many people use a basketball court on an annualized basis? I guarantee you a hundred times more surfers will use a jetty, maybe 200 more times, more, maybe 200 more times will use that, that a basketball court. I asked Tom, uh, who, uh, who just gave, I uh, thought, such an interesting uh, presentation on, uh, on, um, on wave pools. And I said, how many surfers use one of your pools in a day? How many surfers? Uh, and I asked them about this pool that they have in South Africa, and I'm and Shonda Rocks in Durban, they were right there. amazing way of dancing, get barrel there for about five minutes. Um, and he said it's about 80 surfers a wave, so about 160 surfers a day can use a park. But creating a surf park in the ocean, you're talking about hundreds of surfers a day that could use that particular park. So from a perspective of the amount of people that are using a recreational asset, it's very, very effective and efficient. Skate park, relatively inexpensive, 625,000. That's just for the park. That's not including any, any structures. Golf course, three million. Swimming pool, that's just the swimming pool on the cover, 1.9 million. And then the surf park at 3.45 million. Who has jurisdiction over this if we wanted to do this, who has the jurisdiction? First off, it's the Army Corps of Engineers. That is written into the Constitution. The Army of Corps of Engineers has everything to do um, with the coastline. Now, if we wanted to make this happen, how would we do it? How could we do it? Like, if there was a consensus here, and this sounds like a good thing for surfing, is let's get more guys surfing, let's create some more breaks. Focus on a proven design. Focus on a drawing. Like we're going in 15 different directions. We're focusing on one particular design. Raise funding for a research project. I spoke to Professor Stuart Sweeney from UCSB. He said he has graduate students who would love to get involved in doing the research for a project like this. And let's make an outreach specifically to a number of universities. Maybe it's just not UCSB, but San Diego State, Jesse. Um, outreach to the Coastal Commission. Obviously, the Coastal Commission is the final arbiter on one of, whether one of these projects will actually happen. But the Army Corps of Engineers has created 4,000 groins around this country, and I think there's another 4,000 private groins. So it's not like you're dealing with something that hasn't happened before. Outreach obviously to the Army Corps. Outreach to environmental groups. Obviously we would want Surfrider Foundation and other environmental groups to approve of this plan. That this plan both maintains and stabilizes beaches and also creates amazing surf. And then outreach to prospective cities. Because I think that this is where the funding can come from. Because the cities have a lot to benefit. For me, this would be the first step. LA County Surf Park. The LA County beaches stretch from Point Doom all the way through to Cabrillo Beach and Palos Verdes. 50 million visitors a year. 
50 million people hit the beach. They want more usage of their beaches. As part of their strategic plan, they want their beaches to be used year-round. Who uses a beach year-round? Surfers. So it's part of what they want in their strategic plan. You can just read it right there. In goal two, resulting in increased visitorship and more broadly economic development for the region. I'm saying that Los Angeles County Beaches and Harbors want a project like this. Let's give the bloody project to them. Let's get together and give them this project. Objective 1.1, uh, objective 1.1C. This is how they see that they can expand usage of their beaches in winter. Sandcastle competition. Are you being serious? <laughs> I mean, look at it. It's a bloody joke. Can you imagine if they knew that, let's do something for surfers. Let's have those resources used 360 days out of 365. Let's bring families. Let's bring economic development. Let's bring surf schools. Let's bring surf shops. So let's make this happen. I'm up here today to, to hopefully generate some interest in this project. All you people here in this room have got tremendous power. Okay, maybe this is a little bit different, different to what you expected, but we can make this happen. Let's make the world's first ocean surf park. Who wants to help? There's my email, seanthompson at yahoo.com. And I would love to help, but I don't have the academic credentials. I'm not part of the surfing industry, but certainly I can lend my enthusiasm, and I promise you, I will lend you my stuff. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions for Sean besides, uh, actually, go ahead. I'm actually a surfer born and raised from Los Angeles. One of the main issues with LA is you have all the islands blocking for the winter swell. What can you do for that, for the year-round surfing? LA is terrible in the winter, but in the summer you get all the south swell, and Malibu is phenomenal. I suppose if you go up to Ventura County. But in winter, in winter you have to drive south to El Porto, <laughs> Palos Verdes. You, know, you have to just drive maybe 20 minutes south. I know it's a long way, <laughs> but that's what you have to do, unfortunately. <laughs> Obviously, you have to pick your spots. I mean, there, there are some breaks that just don't break year-round. But a lot of breaks break year-round. And, and uh, um, when you put a jetty up there, I don't know what it is. It just sort of seems to focus whatever swell energy you have. It sort of focuses it out there and you just get a better wave and a, a, a two foot swell of close out normally turns into you know, maybe a 50% better type wave. I, mean, I, know, I know it doesn't sound very scientific, but all I'm saying is that I know this jetty growing system works and I'm hoping that uh, we can actually get one implemented that is specifically for surfing with sand stabilization as a secondary. So any other questions? Here's one here. Yeah. I grew up on the East Coast in a town that has a growing every other I'm going to argue with you on some of the points. One, I'm going to agree with you. Groins create the best waves. Perfect, appealing the barrels. It gets hollow, a lot of sand builds up, it gets real shallow, and they take off, they take off behind the rocks. I mean, you can picture snap rocks. What they don't do is protect the erosion. Most beaches have a long, short current going and moving along the beach. It's pretty much universal. On the one side of the groin, the sand will build up, and on the other side, the sand is going to get ripped away. It's a fact. That's how groins work. Some places in California might be a little different from the East Coast. Like you're talking about North Carolina, you're not allowed to build groins in North Carolina because that's what happens. Uh, the giant lighthouse that sat in Buxton had to be moved because of beach erosion. There are two groins sitting right next to it. It doesn't stop erosion. My last point is that the Army Corps of Engineers isn't really out there to help surfers. They've been destroying waves on the East Coast since the 70s, since the 60s. Beach replenishment is terrible for the environment. You pump sand on top of sand and you bury a bunch of animals. And it's, it's just not, so I'm, not, I'm agreeing with you on the fact that groins are great for surfers, but they don't stop erosion and they're not good for the environment. Well, I think a lot of people would disagree with you regarding 
groin stopping erosion because the entire stretch of coastline from Point Magoo all the way, and I've seen the pictures to prove it. I mean, I'm not up here banging a drum because I have any economic motive. I'm, I'm banging a drum here because it's a relatively simple process where you have a 50-yard pier, make it a 150-yard pier, and that pier can maintain the beach in the same state it's in and also improve the surf. And certainly, uh, there are certain areas where, where you would have to modify this concept and perhaps nourish the beach if it was, uh, if, if it fitted into local environmental regulations. I mean, this is not put up a groin and you're gonna get a great wave. I mean, you certainly have to select the particular beaches where you want, um, you know, where you would want a groin. But I've seen it work. I've seen it work amazingly well. And I've seen these little cells, these little surf communities, transform communities and transform young lives. I've seen it happen. And sure, maybe in this spot it's not going to work, and maybe in that spot it's going to be better. So obviously, it's a, it's a matter of, of selecting carefully where you would want to put in a um, put a groin. Do we have another question there? Sean, I'm, I'm extremely encouraged. Sorry, I, I can't hear you, Phil. I'm extremely encouraged by your presentation. I grew up in LA County, and I learned. Oh, it's got yeah. <laughs> And I learned how to surf there, and I learned how to surf at groins. The reality is that the groins are deteriorating, and I can name them all. There's First Jetty in Santa Monica, there's Venice Jetty, there's Toes in Plano Ray, there's Gillis, there's D&W. As a matter of fact, Crass Reef was developed because of the Chevron Jetty that we call Hat Hammerland. There's Sapphire down in Torrance. All of the jetties create fantastic waves. It's a little different in California than the East Coast because we're in LA County because the East Coast is we get north swells that push sand one way and we get south swells that push the sand the other way. The reality is, is that the groins need to be redeveloped because they are deteriorating. And I'd be happy to work with you with the LA County Board of Supervisors and with the LA County lifeguards to encourage the development of that area and to encourage more surf because the surf in front of LAF, the NW, is deteriorating. It has a, it has a inside uh, shore area where the where the rocks aren't and the water runs inside. Well, here we have the first supporter of the project, Scott J. from Bobby. The reality is, is that um, those jetties do create fantastic surf, fantastic tube rides. There was a jetty prior to the Chevron jetty going in called Grand. It was one of the best waves that we had. When the Chevron jetty went in, it did fill in with sand on the north side of it, which eliminated Grand, but that new jetty created new waves. So the reality is, and, and this is, I think it's a bit of a struggle with Surf Rider Foundation in that we call it coastal armament. But the reality is, is it does create surf. And I'm encouraged by your presentation because I know LA County lifeguards want the same thing that you want, the same thing that I want, is to redevelop existing jetties and make sure that those communities understand the economic impact by having those jetties and those surfers. Anyway, thanks. Thanks. Any, any other questions? Or no? Yes, um, how long does it take from building the jetty to the sand form and actually improve the local weather? You know, I have no idea. That's why I'm saying that, you know, a lot of research has to be done on this project. I'm just kicking this, uh, I'm just kicking in this into the surface sphere into, uh, as, a, as an idea for this uh, symposium because I think uh, the most important thing that can happen for all of us to walk away from here is that we've got some great ideas about what we're going to do in the future. And there's going to be I'm sure all sorts of awesome ideas that are, that are thrown out here. And um, um, I like this idea because it's relatively simple. When I say relatively simple, it's, you know, it's a three and a half million dollar investment that can have a lot of upside for a um, community. Maybe not, in the, maybe not in the Carolinas, but certainly uh, in a place like um, Los Angeles County. I live in Panama, United City. Sorry, you might speak about hearing shock. You know, all those years in the surf. <laughs> I live in, um, in Panama where Niger City actually sport resort is and legally for any from beach location it's public like anyone can use the wave 
So it's difficult to manage like an admission fee and stuff like that. So for private investment, I would say something that would be very important would be for privatized companies on a beach front location to invest on the front side so that they could have that way on front of them. I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to make other people not being there because it's public legally. And I don't know how it's like it, it, it's here in the States, but anywhere in Latin America it's pretty much for everyone. So what's the answer for the legal admission for any front side location? Um, I'm not 100% sure wh whether I, I understood the question, but I think the first step here is a research paper. A lot of research has to be done. And um, I know there's a number of people from different university faculties together, and I think if, if there's interest here, I think this could be a joint university exercise between possibly the UCSB, maybe San Diego State, UCSD. I'm not sure there's a lot of universities here in, in, in Southern California that I think would be very interested in this project. I think it's a uh, it's, it, 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 um, this project could really scale and make a difference, uh, uh, I think, around the world to the lives of the surfing, uh, of surfers in the surfing community. Thank you uh, very much. I, I really uh, appreciate it.